as we begin this video series, we are very thankful that you have taken this opportunity to listen to the messages that are being presented, and we hope that you will receive a rich blessing. To begin, we're going to study the children of Abraham. I'd like to begin with reading from Revelation chapter 7, verses 4 through 8. Revelation chapter 7, verses 4 through 8. And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and there were sealed an hundred and forty and four thousand of all the tribes of the children of Israel. Of the tribe of Judah were sealed twelve thousand, of the tribe of Reuben were sealed twelve thousand, of the tribe of Gad were sealed twelve thousand. Of the tribe of Asher were sealed twelve thousand, of the tribe of Naphtali were sealed twelve thousand, of the tribe of Manasseh were sealed twelve thousand. Of the tribe of Simeon were sealed twelve thousand, of the tribe of Levi were sealed twelve thousand, of the tribe of Issachar were sealed twelve thousand, of the tribe of Zebulun were sealed twelve thousand, of the tribe of Joseph were sealed twelve thousand, of the tribe of Benjamin were sealed twelve thousand. We find here the description of the 144,000 as being sealed from all the tribes of the children of Israel. And the question has come over the years, who are the children of Israel? What does it mean of the tribes of children of Israel? Is this speaking about blood lineage? What is even the name, meaning of the name Israel? Let us look at Genesis chapter 32 verse 28. Genesis chapter 32 and verse 28 about the origin of the name Israel. And he said, Thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince hast thou power with God and with men, and hast prevailed. We find here that Jacob had spent an entire night wrestling, wrestling together with an angel. And at the end of that entire night, in the morning as he was holding on for his dear life, he got himself a new name. The name was Israel, meaning overcomer. So the name Israel simply means overcomer. And so when we talk about the 12 tribes of the children of Israel, we are talking about those who are overcomers. Now we need to understand this question a little bit clearer because there's quite an issue today about people looking to Palestine. There's a great war going there constantly, it seems, and people are always questioning whose land does that land belong? That land in Palestine, does it belong to the Israelis? Does it belong to the Palestinians? To whom does it belong? It is interesting that both groups are descendants of the common father. They are descendants of Abraham. Well, who are the children of Abraham? This is an important question because it affects us personally. It affects us as the people of God. Who are the children of Israel? Who are the children of Abraham? To begin with, I want us to turn to Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 to 3. Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 to 3. In these verses, we find the experience of Abraham when he was called out of Ur of Chaldees. It says, Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto the land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Now it says very clearly here, when God called Abraham out of Ur of Chaldees, He says you need to come out of your country, out of your kindred, and out from your father's house. Why was he supposed to come out of his country? Why was he supposed to come out of his kindred? Why was he supposed to come out of his father's house? I would like to read from Patriarchs and Prophets, page 125. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 125. This talks a little bit about the background of what was going on in Ur of Chaldees that necessitated a time for Abraham to leave from there. We read, After the dispersion from Babylon, idolatry again became well-nigh universal. 
And the Lord finally left the hardened transgressors to follow their evil ways, while he chose Abraham of the line of Shem and made him the keeper of his law for future generations. Abraham had grown up in the midst of superstition and heathenism. Even his father's household, by whom the knowledge of God had been preserved, were yielding to the seductive influences surrounding them, and they served other gods than Jehovah. So even the father, his father's household, those who were from the descendants of Shem, they began to compromise. And when they began to compromise, God called Abraham out in order to preserve his law. But the true faith was not to be extinct. God has ever preserved a remnant to serve Him. God always had a people. And through, the, through those ages, it seemed like everything was getting dark and dismal as corruption began to come in. But God says, Oh no, I am going to have a people. Adam, Seth, Enoch, Methuselah, Noah, Shem, in unbroken line, had preserved from age to age the precious revealings of his will. The son of Terah became the inheritor of this holy trust. Idolatry invited him on every side, but in vain. Faithful among the faithless, uncorrupted by the prevailing apostasy, he steadfastly adhered to the worship of the one true God. The Lord is nigh unto all them that call upon him, to all that call upon him in truth. He communicated his will to Abraham and gave him a distinct knowledge of the requirements of his law and of the salvation that would be accomplished through Christ. So God came to Abraham. He revealed himself in a special way and invited him to become the father of the faithful. The message came to Abraham. Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto the land that I will show thee. Why did he do that? It says, in order that God might qualify him for his great work as the keeper of the sacred oracles, Abraham must be separated from the associations of his early life. Oftentimes associations have an effect upon us. And in order to be able to prepare Abraham for his life mission, God had to take Abraham away from those early associations. The influence of kindred and friends would interfere with the training which the Lord purposed to give His servant. They would have interfered. They would not have allowed Abraham to receive the training that was necessary. So God took him away from the associations of his early life. Now that Abraham was in a special sense connected with heaven, he must dwell among strangers. Now what does it mean to dwell among strangers? Why was it that he had to go among a people that were totally heathen. Why couldn't he stay there in Ur? They had people there. His father's household still believed in the true God. But you know something? There was a compromise situation. It was better for Abraham to live totally among the heathen than it was to live among those who had mixed truth and error. The influence of his kindred and friends would interfere with the training which the Lord purposed to give his servants. Now that Abraham was in a special sense connected with heaven, he must dwell among strangers. His character must be peculiar, differing from all the world. He could not even explain his course of action so as to be understood by his friends. His friends could not understand him and he could not explain it to them because spiritual things are spiritually discerned and his motives and actions were not comprehended by his idolatrous kindred. They could not understand and because they could not understand, God said, come out and I will take you to a land that I am going to show you. And then he says in verse 3, Genesis 12, verse 3, And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Now what is the meaning of this term, in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed? Well, we are going to go over to the book of Galatians. Galatians chapter 3, where the Apostle Paul explains the meaning of of this passage. Galatians chapter 3 verses 8 and 9. Galatians 3 verses 8 and 9. And this scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith 
preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. Notice here, it says that the gospel was preached unto Abraham. And what words were used here in the gospel? It says, In thee shall all nations of the earth be blessed. This was nothing else but the preaching of the gospel. And the gospel saw that the heathen must be justified. And to do so, the gospel must be preached to them. Now, how can the gospel blessing come to us? How can we also receive this gospel blessing? In verse 9 it says, So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. So if we participate by faith, we also can receive the same gospel blessing to each and every one of our own selves. Now, what is the gospel? When we talk about the gospel, what are we talking about? Romans chapter 1 and verse 16. Romans 1.16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So what is the gospel? When we're talking about the gospel, what are we talking about? It says here that it is the power of God unto salvation. That's what the gospel is. He says, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation. The power of God to be able to save us. This gospel power, when it says, to whom is this given? The power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. But now what is this belief? This belief is a little bit more than just belief. And we'll study a little bit about that later on in this series. But in Romans chapter 1 verse 17, the very next verse, it explains that this belief in order to have the power of the gospel is actually called faith. Romans 1 verse 17 says, For herein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. So this gospel power is given to those who grasp a hold of it by faith. And the gospel was preached to Abraham. It says, In thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. This was the preaching of the gospel unto Abraham. Since the preaching of the gospel is the power of God unto salvation, then when Abraham accepted the promise that in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed, it was he was receiving at that time the power of God unto salvation. Now, what is the gospel? Yes, it is the power of God unto salvation, but what do we preach when we preach the gospel? Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 17 and 18. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 17 and 18. It says, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. So what was He going to do? He was going to preach the gospel. This was the work that, that Paul was doing. He says, He did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with the wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. Now what is the power of God here? Notice here he first mentions that we are going to do what? He says we are going to preach the gospel. So he's preaching the gospel. And then he says something else. He says that he preached what? He preached the cross of Christ. So if he says that the preaching of the gospel is the preaching of the cross of Christ, then the cross of Christ, preaching of the cross of Christ, is the gospel. And that's why it says it is the power of God. Oh, what did it say in Romans? The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. So the preaching of the cross is the same. It is the gospel. It is the power of God unto salvation. So if the gospel is the preaching of the cross 
and the gospel was preached unto Abraham, then we must recognize that the gospel, the cross of Christ, was preached to Abraham. Abraham must have understood the gospel. And Abraham must have understood the cross of Jesus Christ. Without the cross, there is no gospel. The cross is the most important thing in the plan of redemption. This reason in Review and Herald, June 24, 1902. Review and Herald, June 24, 1902 says, God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. This was promised to Abraham and the promise was conferred by an oath. God swearing by Himself for our sake that we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope that is set before us. Down a bit further says, All things are assured to us in Christ and only in Him. There is nothing in this world or in the world to come that we can have except through the cross. There is nothing we can have in this world. We cannot even live. Even those who do not accept Christ as their personal Savior, they would not have life in this world. They would not have the blessings that are provided for us if it was not for the cross of Christ. The cross of Christ made all this possible. And even the future world. We can have nothing in the future world. Not one of us can have one little thing in that future world if it was not for the cross of Jesus Christ. So in these words, in these shall the families of the world be blessed, was the preaching of the cross of Christ, and that is what Abraham understood. For this reason, in John chapter 8, verse 56, John chapter 8, verse 56, when Jesus was having a debate together with the Jewish people, he came to them, he gave them a very strong evidence that he is the Messiah. He says, verse 56, Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. What did Abraham do? Abraham looked to see the day of Christ. And what did he do? He saw it and he was glad. Now, why was he glad? Because he saw salvation. He saw salvation through what? through the cross of Christ. Yes, Abraham looked down the ages and he saw Calvary. And when he saw Calvary, he was happy as a result. In SDA Bible Commentary, Volume 1, page 1092. One Bible Commentary, 1092. It says, How did Abraham know of the coming of the Redeemer? How did he know of Him? It says, God gave him light in regard to the future. God showed it to him. He looked forward to the time when the Savior should come to this earth, His divinity veiled by humanity. He looked to that and he saw God coming down to this world and clothed in humanity. By faith he saw the world's Redeemer coming as God in the flesh. He saw the weight of guilt lifted from the human race and borne by the divine substitute. In Youth Instructor, September 13, 1900. Youth Instructor, September 13, 1900. It says, God made the promise to Abraham, in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. To Abraham was unfolded God's purpose for the redemption of the race. The Son of Righteousness shone upon him and his darkness was scattered. So as he was in the darkness there and he looked forward to the future, he saw the coming Messiah. And when he saw the coming Messiah, his darkness disappeared. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day and he saw it and was glad. In the book Desire of Ages, page 468. Desire of Ages, page 468. It says there, Abraham had greatly desired to see the promised Savior. He had such a desire to see that Savior come. He offered up the most earnest prayers that before his death he might behold the Messiah. So he prayed earnestly, Oh, before I die, can I see the Messiah? And he saw Christ. A supernatural light was given him. And he acknowledged Christ's divine character. He saw his day and was glad. He was given a view of the divine sacrifice for sin. 
Yes, he saw the cross of Christ. And when he saw the cross of Christ, he was satisfied. He was ready to go to the grave. Abraham saw Christ as the only means for salvation. Abraham knew that and he accepted it by faith. In the book Everlasting Covenant by E.J. Wagner, I'd like to read this paragraph. It says on page 48, This is a fact that needs to be well fixed in the mind at the very beginning. All these misunderstandings of the promises of God to Abraham and his seed have arisen through a failure to see the gospel of the cross of Christ in them. People grab after the promises, but they don't see the cross of Christ in there. If it be continually remembered that all the promises of God are in Christ to be enjoyed only through His cross, and that consequently they are spiritual and eternal in their nature, there will be no difficulty and the study of the promise of the fathers will be a delight and a blessing. You see, all the promises that God gave to Abraham, they were not temporal. They were of an eternal nature. They were all through the cross of Jesus Christ. Now what else was promised to Abraham? Let's look again in Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12, verses 6 and 7. And Abraham passed through the land unto the place of Sychem, unto the plain of Mori. And the Canaanite was then in the land. And the Lord appeared unto Abram and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. And there built he an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. The promise here was, Unto your seed will I give this land. Which land is he talking about? Well, Abraham was looking at the land of Canaan. So now when he says, Unto your seed will I give this land, which seed was he talking about? You know, you had Ishmael and you had Isaac. And today the descendants of Ishmael and Isaac are still fighting for the land. They said it was given to me. Well, to which one was it given? To Ishmael or to Isaac? Which one was the land given to? Oh, for that matter we recognize, okay, it was given to Isaac according to the Bible. Well, what about a little bit later on? What about with Isaac? Isaac had two children. He had Esau and Jacob. To which of them was the land promised? Well, we say Jacob, but why Jacob? And by rights, by the way, you know, just stop and think a little bit about rights. We often think to ourselves, well, I have the right to do this. Or it was given to me. It wasn't given to someone else. Well, the promises were all the time given to the firstborn son. And so when you take a look at it, if you look at Abraham... His firstborn son was Ishmael. His second son. His second son was Isaac. And by the way, Abraham had even more children than that. You see, when, when Sarah died... Abraham went ahead and got married again. And when he got married again, what did he have then? We turn to Genesis chapter 25. Genesis 25 verses 1 and on. Then again, Abraham took a wife and her name was Keturah. And she bare him Zimram and Jokshan and Medan and Midian and Ishbak and Shua. So he married another woman. Keturah after Sarah died and he had more children. Which of them have let claims to that land? Well, if anybody has, as far as we are thinking, if anyone has the major right, it would be Ishmael. But it was not given to Ishmael, it was given to Isaac. And then what about Isaac? Isaac also had children. His firstborn was Esau. His secondborn was Jacob. Why do we then say that Jacob is the inheritor? Why do we say Isaac and then Jacob? Why is that? There must be a particular reason. And today, which, to whom does the land belong over there in Palestine? Does it belong to the descendants of, of Jacob? Or does it belong to the descendants of Ishmael? To whom does that land belong? And I want to share with you that it belongs to neither one. Let us take a look at a few things in the scriptures. It says there, 
unto thy seed. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 12. Verse 7, And the Lord appeared unto Abram and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. Now, who is the seed that the land is given to? Let's go again to Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3 has a lot of light on many subjects here, especially as we're dealing with the Old Testament. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 16. Galatians 3 and verse 16. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He said, Not unto seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed which is Christ. So as Paul was looking there at that Old Testament promises, by inspiration he recognized something. He recognized that the promises to Abraham and the seed was singular. It did not speak to seeds as of many, but as of one. And that seed that was promised, all these promises of land were to, it went directly not to Ishmael, not to Isaac, not to Esau or Jacob. It went directly to Jesus Christ. The seed is Jesus. And this is why it says, In thee, in your seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. It is only through Jesus Christ that all the families will receive a special blessing. Does this promise include anyone else besides Jesus Christ? Does the promise of that inheritance belong to anyone else? Let's look again in Galatians chapter 3. Let's look at verses 27 to 29. Galatians 3 verse 27 to 29 says, for as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye are Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So what does it say here? What promise is there given to us? It says here very clearly that Abraham received the promise that in his seed all the earth will be blessed. And being in his seed, it is Jesus Christ as of one, and that is Jesus Christ. And being one Jesus Christ, what does that mean? It means that if we accept Jesus, we are the seed of Abraham. That's right. If I accept Jesus Christ, I am the seed of Abraham. I am a child of Abraham. If I do not accept Christ, I do not have the promise. So the promises are not given merely by lineage. It is given directly through Jesus Christ. You can forget about lineage. Because there's quite a few people here in this lineage who got missed out. Esau never got anything. Esau will receive absolutely zero of the promise that was given here. So all the promises here are through Jesus Christ. If I accept Jesus, I am the seed of Abraham. Some years ago, I was visiting a place and I met a Jewish person. She accepted Christianity. And she told me, oh, I'm a Jew. And I said, oh, wonderful, I am too. And she says, oh, really? It's very rare to meet some you know, Jews that are Christians like this. I said, yes, but I'm a Jew by the second birth, not by the first. And so you see, we are Jews. We are Abraham's children through Jesus Christ. So what we have to ask simply is which one of these children accepted Jesus Christ in their lifetime? If we take a look at the experience here, you look at Ishmael. Did he accept Jesus in his lifetime? You take a look at Isaac. Did he accept Jesus in his lifetime? Which one of these, Ishmael or Isaac, received Jesus Christ? You know something? Both of them did. Ishmael also accepted Jesus and Isaac accepted Jesus. But the problem with Ishmael was he accepted Jesus very late. You see in Patriarch and Prophets, page 174, Patriarch and Prophets 174 says, Abraham's early teachings had not been without effect upon Ishmael, but the influence of his wives resulted in establishing idolatry in his family. 
When he got married, he married the wrong people through the influence of his mother. And idolatry was established in his family. Separated from his father and embittered by the strife and contention of a home, destitute of the love and fear of God, Ishmael was driven to choose the wild, marauding life of the desert chief. His hand against every man and every man's hand against him. In his latter days, he repented of his evil ways and returned to his father's God. But the stamp of character given to his posterity remained. The powerful nation descended from him were a turbulent heathen people who were ever an annoyance and affliction to the descendants of Isaac. So although Isaac, Ishmael finally repented, he could not be used in this lineage. His children rejected it and therefore the promise we must look through those who accepted Jesus as their personal Savior. So if we accept Jesus, we become a child of Abraham. And why is that? <clears throat> Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. So when we accept Jesus as our personal Savior, we actually become a new creature. We are created again. And when something is created again, what is the term that we use? You recall in the case, in the story of Nicodemus, when Jesus was talking to Nicodemus, he called it something else. He called it the new birth. He says, you must be born again. And so, when we are born again, we are born no longer just of our human nature. We are born of another nature, born of the Holy Spirit, and therefore we become children of Abraham and heirs of the, according to the promise. In Christ Object Lessons, page 163, it says, Christ Object Lessons 163, As the sinner, drawn by the power of Christ, approaches the uplifted cross, and prostrates himself before it, there is a new creation. A new heart is given him. He becomes a new creature in Christ Jesus. So again, here we go up again about the cross of Christ. It is when we come to the cross of Christ and we are drawn to the cross of Christ, we prostrate ourselves before it, we fall down before the cross, it is only then that we become a new creature. And it may take us a long time in life, but it's only because we resist of that. God is calling every one of us today. He says, come, come to the cross of Christ. Put down our will and accept the will of Jesus Christ and become the children of Abraham. Notice in Genesis chapter 17, we find here a little bit more about the promise that was given to Abraham. It was not only that the promises were given to the seed of Abraham. Genesis chapter 17, verses 7 and 8. Genesis 17, verses 7 and 8. And I will establish my covenant between me and thee, and thy seed after thee in their generations, for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee, and to thy seed after thee. And I will give unto thee, and to thy seed after thee, the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. So it says here very clearly that I am going to give not only to your seed, but also unto Abraham. Abraham himself must be the possessor of that land. Although Abraham was living in the land of Canaan, did he ever possess it? No, he lived there as a stranger. In Acts chapter 7 and verse 5, Acts chapter 7 and verse 5, we have the record given by Stephen about the experience of Abraham. Acts chapter 7 verse 5 says, and he gave him none inheritance in it, no, not so much as to set his foot on. He didn't even have a chance to own, to actually inherit anything. He had a little place, but he purchased it, a cave of Machpelah, in order to bury the dead. But now before Abraham was getting too old, God told him something else about that particular promise. Genesis chapter 15, verses 13 through 15. And specifically, we're just going to read verse 15. After telling about the promise that he's going to inherit the land, in verse 15 it says, And thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace, thou shalt be buried in a good old age. So he tells him, 
Abraham, before you receive any inheritance, you're going to go down into the grave. Now, did God lie? Is God a liar saying, I'm going to give you an inheritance? And he dies along the way. No. In 2 Timothy 2 verse 13, 2 Timothy 2 13 says, If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. God will not lie. God will fulfill his promise. Now we look down the line and see about David. Maybe David finally got his promises. Because you remember David was king over what? He was not only king over Judea, he was king oh, all the way, all the way down to the river Euphrates. It may seem that, oh, maybe then the promise was fulfilled. But you know, David did not inherit that land. David was a warrior. He went and he fought and he obtained that land. That fighting is not inheriting. Inheritance means that it is given to you. And for that reason, in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 32 and 39, verse 32 mentions David as one of those in the list. And verse 39 says, And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. They also never received the promise. But why did they never receive the promise? Because their promises were not of a temporal nature. It was not only that little bit of land there in we call it Palestine. The promise was given to Abraham and we read this in Romans chapter 4 and verse 13. Romans chapter 4 and verse 13. It says, For the promise that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. So how much land it says here? It was of the entire world. That was the promise that God gave to him. Isaiah chapter 66 and verse 22. Isaiah chapter 66 and verse 22 tells about the hope and the faith that these people had. These men of those times, where was their hope? Where was their desire to be? Isaiah chapter 66 and verse 22. Isaiah 66 verse 22 says, for as the new heavens and the new earth which I will make shall remain before me, saith the Lord, so shall your seed and your name remain. They kept thinking not of the temporal nature here. They were thinking of a new heaven and they were thinking of a new earth. Now why wasn't Abraham able to inherit the new earth beginning with Canaan at his time? Why couldn't he start with Canaan? Of course God intended them to do that. But why couldn't Abraham at that time, right when he was faithful in serving the Lord, why couldn't he inherit the land then? Well, let's look in Genesis chapter 15 and verse 16. Why did Abraham have to die before any inheritance? Genesis chapter 15 and verse 16. After saying, Thou shalt be buried in a good old age, it says, But in the fourth generation they shall come hither again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. You see, the Amorites' cup of iniquity was still not full. And so long as they had some hope, so long as they had a hope of salvation, God was not going to take them away. God was going to give them a chance over and over again until their cup of iniquity was full. And as God looked down the line, He saw that that time will be 400 years later. Again, from the book Everlasting Covenant on page 70, Wagner writes, God would not cast out of the land those of whom there was any seeming prospect that they might be righteous. So these Amorites, if they had a prospect of being righteous, we're not going to throw them out of the land. But the fact that the people who were to be destroyed from before the children of Abraham were to be cast out because of their wickedness shows that the possessors of the land were expected to be righteous. Those who possess that land must be a righteous people. And thus we learn that the seed of Abraham to whom the land was promised were to be the righteous people. Let's look again in Isaiah chapter 60 and verse 21. Isaiah chapter 60 and verse 21. Isaiah 60 verse 21, To whom is that land going to be forever their possession? Isaiah 60 verse 21 says, Thy people also shall be all righteous. They shall inherit the land forever, the branch of my planting, the work of my hands, that I may be glorified. 
So thy people shall be what kind of a people? They shall be all righteous. What percentage is all righteous? The all is 100%. So it's 100% righteous people that shall inherit the land. If they are not 100% righteous, they are not going to inherit it. And what land were they looking for? What was that land of promise? What was that real Canaan land? Let's look at Hebrews chapter 11, verses 13 through 16. Hebrews 11, 13 through 16. What was Abraham looking forward to? What was Isaac looking forward to? What were these men of God looking forward to? Hebrews chapter 11, verses 13 through 16. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off. They saw them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. They realized we are strangers and pilgrims here. We don't belong here. We belong over there. Where is that that they belong to? For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of the country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. They could have come back any time. But now they desire a better country that is in heavenly, wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for He hath prepared for them a city. God is preparing a place for these type of people whose hope is not in this earth, but in another earth, another time. Just to read a little bit from Patriarchs and Prophets, page 169 to 170. Patriarchs and Prophets 169 to 170. It summarizes this whole picture a little bit for us about the promises that were given to Abraham. It says the heritage that God has promised to His people is not in this world. Abraham had no possession in the earth. No, not so much as to set his foot on. He possessed great substance and he used it to the glory of God and the good of his fellow men. But he did not look upon this world as his home. It wasn't his place. The Lord had called him to leave his idolatrous countrymen with the promise of the land of Canaan as an everlasting possession. Yet neither he nor his son nor his son's sons received it. When Abraham desired a burial place for his dead, he had to buy it of the Canaanites. His sole possession in the land of promise was that rock-hued tomb in the cave of Machpelah. But the word of God had not failed. Neither did it meet its final accomplishment in the occupation of Canaan by the Jewish people. To Abraham and his seed were the promises made. Abraham himself was to share in the inheritance. The fulfillment of God's promise may seem to be long delayed. For one day is with the Lord as a thousand years and a thousand years as a day. It may appear to tarry, but at the appointed time it will surely come. It will not tarry. The gift to Abraham and his seed included not merely the land of Canaan, but the whole earth. Down a little bit further. And the Bible plainly teaches that the promises made to Abraham are to be fulfilled through Christ. All that are Christ are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Heirs to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that fadeth not away. Down further, God gave to Abraham a view of this immortal inheritance and with this hope he was content. He was satisfied. If he could only see it a little bit, he'd say, oh, that's enough. I don't need any more. He saw it and he says, I am going there. I'm not going anywhere else. I don't want to go back. I want to go there to that promised land. Those who are the children of Abraham will be seeking the city which he looked for, whose builder and maker is God. What are you looking for? Are you looking for an earthly home? Or are you looking for that city whose builder and maker is God? In the days of Jesus, the Jewish people were real, real, real well entrenched in the belief that they were the children of Abraham. Let's look at John chapter 8 verse 39. John chapter 8 and verse 39. It says here, They answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said unto them, If ye were Abraham's children, ye would do the works of Abraham. If you were the children of Abraham, he didn't tell him you are. He said, If you are the child of Abraham, you would act like Abraham. So, in, so Jesus did not recognize those Jews in his day, those leaders in his time, as the children of Abraham because they were working contrary to what Abraham would do. 
in verse 44, he told him really what he thought. He says in verse 44, you are of your father, the devil. He did not grant them that they were Abraham's children. Oh no, they were the fa their father was the devil, not Abraham. Why? Because they acted like the devil. It says here, You're of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. And so it is that Jesus did not allow people who did not live to the character of Abraham to be called the children of Abraham. In Desire of Ages, page 466, commenting on this particular passage. Desire of Ages, page 466. Let me read you from this book here. Desire of Ages, page 466. What was it like among the children of Abraham? 466. The Pharisees had declared themselves the children of Abraham. They said, we are the children of Abraham. Jesus told them that this claim could be established only by doing the works of Abraham. So let's take a look and see a few points here on what does it required in order to be a child of Abraham. What must we possess to be called the children of Abraham? Everyone says, oh, I've given my heart to the Lord. Well, have you? What does it mean to give your heart to the Lord? Does it mean just to say a couple of words, meaning I'm giving my heart to Jesus? No. It says here, the Pharisees had declared themselves the children of Abraham. Jesus told them that this claim could be established only by doing the works. The works of Abraham. So, unless we have the works of Abraham, we are not the children of Abraham. Let's put here, children of Abraham. The true children of Israel would live as he did a life of obedience to God. So live the life of Abraham. So we must do the works of Abraham. We must live the life of Abraham. They would not try to kill one who was speaking the truth that was given him of God. In plotting against Christ, the rabbis were not doing the works of Abraham. A mere lineal descent from Abraham was of no value. So a lineal descent was how valuable? Merely this lineal descent was actually of no value. To them, the lineal descent meant everything, but to Jesus Christ it meant nothing. You see, without a spiritual connection with Him, which would be manifested in possessing the same Spirit and doing the same works, they were not His children. So there was the spiritual connection. And then you had, which was shown what? In having the same Spirit, the Spirit of Abraham. The Spirit of Abraham and doing the same works. They were not His children. And by the way, this is not just lineal descent, but mere, mere lineal descent. Only that, that was not enough. If they had lineal descent and had all of this, that would have made all the difference. But without, the lineal des without all these others, the lineal descent meant nothing. Now this same idea is not only applied back then. We can look back at the children of Israel and say, oh yeah, it belongs to them. But you know, it belongs a little bit more. It says, this principle bears with equal weight upon a question that has long agitated the Christian world, the question of apostolic succession. Descent from Abraham was proved not by name and lineage. So li lineal descent, name. Name meant what? That was not enough. It was not enough. Not by name and lineage, but by likeness of character. These things here. So the apostolic succession rests not upon the transmission of ecclesiastical authority, but upon spiritual relationship. A life actuated by the apostle spirits. The belief and teachings of the truth they taught. This is the true evidence of apostolic succession. This is what constitutes men, the successors of the first teachers of the gospel. 
Today the question is often asked also in Adventism. Oh, who is the real Seventh-day Adventist church? Well, the question is answered not by name, not by lineage, but by what? But by likeness of character. We have to look at the life and teachings of the pioneers. We have to look at the apostolic spirit. We have to look at the life of Abraham. And it is only as we possess that experience, it is only as we have the same experience as those forefathers can we lay claim to the, the right to be the church of today. Let me read it one more time. This principle bears with equal weight upon a question that has long agitated the Christian world, the question of apostolic succession. You know, a couple of years ago, I was there at the Vatican, and right there in the St. Peter's Basilica, there's a big, long list of names. This pope came from this pope. He was from this pope and all the way down, all the way down until they claim to St. Peter. And they claim that is their apostolic succession. But you know, that is worth nothing in the eyes of God. This principle bears with equal weight upon a question that has long agitated the Christian world, the question of apostolic succession. Descent from Abraham was proved not by name and lineage, but by likeness of character. So the apostolic succession rests not upon the transmission of ecclesiastical authority, but upon spiritual relationship. A life actuated by the Apostle Spirit, the belief and teaching of the truth they taught, this is the true evidence of apostolic succession. This is what constitutes men, the successors of the first teachers of the Gospel. And so I invite you to take your time right now to watch the entire video series, to listen to the truths that are being taught from the Bible and from the Spirit of Prophecy. And I urge you to study for yourself, be like the Bereans, you remember the experience that was written there for us in the book of Acts. We find when, Ro when Paul went to the city of Rome, he was there as a, he was bound, he was, a, he was on a, as a slave, he was going there for trial. And when he came among the Jewish people, in Acts chapter 28 verse 21 it says, And they said unto him, We neither received letters out of Judea concerning thee, neither any of the brethren that came showed or spake any harm of thee. But we desire to hear of thee what thou thinkest. For as concerning this sect, we know that everywhere it is spoken against. But these people had the right attitude. They said, we want to know for ourselves. Prayerfully study to understand who are the children of Abraham. And I appeal to each one of you that you may experience that life of Jesus, that you may come up to that uplifted cross, give your all to there, and become a child of Abraham.